music. What thoughts, ideas, sounds, images fill your mind when you hear that word? Nietzsche described it as Mysterium Tremendum. This power has been a force in every culture in the history of mankind. Indeed, it is of such power that many authoritarian regimes have banned or controlled it as a way to prevent independence of spirit. The Taliban strictly censors music in Afghanistan, where only religious singing without musical instruments is permitted. There are many other examples of this type control in both modern and ancient cultures. But what is music? Where does it come from? How do our brains process it? Why do we need it? Consider this. There are three dimensions of true child prodigy. Music, mathematics and chess. Why is that? And what does it say about these three disciplines? They are essentially fundamental to the way the human brain likes to organize itself. Music is as important to the development of the very young child as maths is. It's fundamental to develop the whole child and should be never be viewed as a recreational frill. We hate disorder as human beings. When there is disorder and chaos, we cannot advance as a species. Music, maths and chess are all disciplines of patterning. The brain likes patterning and structure. Most importantly, the right balance of the familiar and newness. The mathematician Marcus de Sotoy likes to use this quotation. Music is the way non-mathematicians appreciate maths. Thanks to brain imaging, we can see that more areas of the brain light up during music activity than any other activity. Here's a diagram. Look at those nine areas in very different parts of the brain that are activated. No other activity comes close to activating the entire brain, not to mention endorphin release, social bonding, and so much more that we know about. Here, for example, are the emotional regions of the brain activated by music. Music, maths, and chess. We teach these disciplines, if we teach them right, in the same way by establishing the foundations well before progress progressing through the spiral of learning. There is only one person in the world in modern history who has not only understood this, but managed to enshrine it at the very center of a national education system for several decades. He is the Hungarian composer Zoltán Kodály who died in 1967. Is it a coincidence that Hungary has more Nobel Prize winners per capita than any other nation? Could this be integral with putting creativity at the center of the education system as the Hungarians did? Kodai developed a system of music education through the singing voice for every child not just those deemed to be musically talented, with stunning results. Here are his basic philosophical principles. To be a complete personality, as he put it, you must have or speak the language of music. Music reaches areas of the soul, the deep recesses of the soul, that nothing else can. And this process must start from the very earliest age, the mother singing to the child, and then be taught through a progression of learning, like we teach mathematics. We stand on the shoulders of giants, and Kodai was the greatest of these. His ideas 
and application of those ideas, in my view, helped to shape the entire Hungarian nation during and after his extraordinary life. Here is one of the most amazing quotes that I love so much from Kodai. Music teaches more than music alone. Singing liberates, encourages, cures inhibition and shyness. It helps concentration, improves physical and spiritual disposition, inspires one for work and makes us more fit for it. It makes one accustomed to discipline and attention. It affects the whole body, not only certain parts of it. It develops community spirit. It develops sensibility for music, which is present in everybody from embryo, thus providing the foundations of musical knowledge, which will in turn make people's lives richer and more beautiful. I encountered the staggering results of the Kodai philosophy and methodology in a classroom in Kecskemét in Hungary during the 1990s on my Winston Churchill traveling fellowship. From that moment, it's no exaggeration to say my life changed. It was a thunderbolt of enlightenment to see every single child in that primary classroom, not just those deemed to be musically talented, reading music, performing in multiple parts, improvising, memorizing, composing. They were fully musical, musically literate, if you like, and loving every moment of it with such confidence and cooperation and fun. It was just breathtaking. Another giant of educational thinking is Harvard's professor, Howard Gardner. He believes, as I have come to, that we are born with multiple intelligences and that all of these intelligences must be developed in early learning, pre-puberty. Here are the eight basic intelligences. Spatial, linguistic, mathematical, kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, naturalistic, and musical. Currently, this is difficult, if not impossible to prove quantitatively, but anecdotally, the evidence is abundant. I have witnessed miracles almost daily in the classroom. Once an eight-year-old refugee child in inner city London, who had been electively mute for two years, spontaneously sang during one of my Kodai sessions. The class teacher wept. Thereafter, the child started to speak. For over three decades, I've worked with thousands of children all over the world and have come to understand and witness the secret power of music in their development as complete, balanced, and tolerant human beings. But the real transfigurative power of music comes when experience the effect of great music, when we become different people during the performance of a musical masterpiece. For me, these seminal moments came on three separate occasions when I could feel myself being in some way transfigured. First, during a live performance of Bach's St. Matthew Passion when I was 14. Then much later in my life during Parsifal at Bayreuth as an adult. And finally, in Soweto in South Africa, when I went from church to church one Sunday, some with makeshift altars and township houses listening to the singing. It unlocked something I can't begin to describe. I could actually feel the shift in my soul. The future of choral music is now at the heart of my work. I formed Aura Singers to be a catalyst in creating the great compositions of the future, to commission composers and to record 
their great new choral works that are in turn reflections of great masterpieces of the past. Our mission at Aura Singers is to commission and record with the best choral musicians in the world, 100 works by 100 composers reflecting 100 Renaissance choral masterpieces, thus creating a bridge between the golden age of the Renaissance and what I believe is our current golden age the golden age of 21st century choral composition. We are halfway through that endeavor with 49 new works, nine albums and a national mentoring scheme for state school young composers. And all within our first five years, I'm proud to say. The 50th commission will mark Aura Singer's 50th birthday. Sorry, the Aura Singer's fifth birthday. I'd like you to hear the final section of our 49th commission, a reflection of Talis's great 40 part motet, Speminalium, a musical monolith of the Renaissance. This commission by Sir James Macmillan, our greatest living choral composer, was premiered during COVID lockdown in an empty turbine hall in Tate Modern, live streamed and with no live audience. We've already had 300,000 views and counting and messages, one from Antarctica, saying how much solace and joy this had brought them. Does this indicate a greatly enhanced hunger for culture in times of adversity? Here is the final Alleluia of Aura Singer's Commission, Vidi Aquan by Sir James Macmillan. The ordinary man casts a shadow in a way we do not quite understand. The man of genius casts light. This is a quote from George Steiner, who very sadly died recently. He's described as a polyglot and polymath, but he's essentially he was a philosopher with an enlightened understanding of the supreme power of music. But what do we, what environment do we need for musical genius to flourish, for this secret power to be unleashed through the vehicle of individual human endeavor. It's clear to me that great composers have needed three things. Firstly, faith at a personal level. They are operating through a higher power, one bigger than themselves, beyond their own human limitations. Secondly, a cultural environment or a zeitgeist, which includes support 
through enlightened philanthropy, a sensitized, hungry public, and a movement, a sort of kindred spirit amongst fellow composers. And thirdly, adversity, either personal or global or both. Sweet are the uses of adversity. This has, for as long as I can remember, been my motto. Yet again, Shakespeare articulates something we may feel in our inner core, but have never made conscious. Is this the definition of genius? The moment I heard this line, sweet are the uses of adversity, during a live performance of As You Like It, I experienced a sort of revelation. I may have been sensitized to this by my own family history of displacement, confused identity. I come from a family of refugees and expats in the Far East over a hundred years. But this is certainly how I've come to view how cultural genius gives birth to our greatest music. My father used to use the symbolism of vines and great wines. The greatest wine comes from the toughest soil. The roots have to go deep and to strengthen, to find the nourishment to survive and then flourish. So to our post pandemic world, I share the vision of epidemiologist, Dr. Nicholas Christakis. He looks to the past to predict a second post-pandemic roaring 20s. That future, he predicts, will not come until society has had time to distribute the vaccine worldwide, probably through 2021, and had time to recover from the socioeconomic devastation it has wrought, probably through 2023. But the vision he lays out for 2024 and beyond is one filled with experiences pined for in isolation, packed stadiums, crowded nightclubs, and flourishing arts. And it's important to remember that Clement Attlee won over Churchill the post-war election as prime minister with this comprising the three cornerstones of his manifesto as the human rights of the common man who had suffered so greatly during the war. Health, education, and culture. From my perspective, the choral musicians emerging from our music schools are better today than they've ever been in performance history. This is paralleled by the brilliance of instrumentalists and composers. The adversity of our times will bear great fruit.